They came up over a steep hill and down a zigzag track to Stickle Haven, a mere cluster of cottages with a fishing boat or two drawn up on the beach. Illuminated by the setting sun, they had their first glimpse of Soldier Island jetting up out of the sea to the south. Vera said, surprised, it's a long way out. She had pictured it differently, close to shore, crowned with a beautiful white house, but there was no house visible. Only the boldly still hotted rock with its faint resemblance to a giant head. There was something sinister about it. She shivered faintly. Outside a little inn, the seven stars, three people were sitting. There was a hundred elderly figure of the judge, the upright form of Miss Brent, and a third man, a big bluff man, who came forward and introduced himself. Thought we might as well wait for you, he said. Make one trip of it. Allow me to introduce myself. Name's Davis. Natal, South Africa is my natal spot. Haha. <laughs> he laughed breezily. Mr. Justice Wargrave looked at him with active malevolent lessons. He seemed to be wishing that he could order the court to be cleared. Miss Emily Brent was clearly not sure if she liked colonials. Anyone care for a little nip before we embark? asked Mr. Davis hospitably. Nobody assenting to this proposed decision. Mr. Tavis turned and held up a finger. Must not delay then. Our good host and hostess will be expecting us, he said. He might have noticed that a curious constraint came over the other members of the party. It was as though the mention of their host and hostess has a curiously paralyzing effect upon the guest. In response to Davis, Beckoning finger, a man detached himself from a nearby wall against which he was leaning and came up to them. His rolling gait proclaimed him as a man of the sea. He had a weather bitten face and dark eyes with a slightly evasive expression. He spoke in his soft Devon voice. Will you be ready to be starting for the island, ladies and gentlemen? The boat's waiting. There is two gentlemen coming by car, but, but Mr. Owen's orders was not to wait for them as they might arrive at any time. The party got up. Their guide led them along a small stone jerry. Alongside as a motorboat was lying. Emily Brent said, That's very small boat. The boat's owner said persuasively, She's a fine boat, that ma'am. You could go to Plymouth in her as easy as winking, Mr. Justice Walgrave said sharply. There are a good of many of us. She'd take double the numbers, sir, Philip Lombard said in his pleasant, easy voice. It's quite all right. Glorious weather, no swell. Rather doubtfully, Miss Brent permitted herself to be helped into the boat. The others followed suit. There was yet no fraternizing among the party. It was as though each member of it was puzzled by the other members. They were just about to cast loose when their guide paused, boat hook in hand. Down the steep track into the village a car was coming, a car so fantastically powerful, so superlatively beautiful that it had all the nature of an apparition. At the wheel sat a young man, his hair brown black by the wind. In the blaze of the evening light he looked, not a man, but a young god a hero god out of some northern saga. He touched the horn and a great roar of sound echoed from the rocks of the bay. It was a fantastic moment. In it, Anthony Marston seemed to be something more than mortal. Afterwards, more than one of those present remembered that moment.